Super, thank you. And um, thanks for having me here today. I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, is that working okay? Super, thanks. Um, so yes, thank you very much for um, having us here today. Uh, delighted to be here and start putting some, some faces to names in the department. So um, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, the Share It Online Toolkit today, uh, which is one aspect of the Share City Research Project. So I'm gonna talk about how um, it aims to capture sustainability impacts of food sharing in cities. Um, so the talk outline I'm going to go through today is a little bit about the Share City Research Project, uh, which Kate has touched on already, um, a bit about what food sharing is and what we mean by food sharing when we're talking about it in this project, um, the online share it toolkit that was developed by Anna and Stephen McKenzie and what the next steps are for that toolkit, which I will be doing hopefully over the next um, eight months or so. So Share City is a five year ERC research project currently in its final year and myself and Louise joined in June of this year. It has lots of different um, sort of pillars of activity going on, um, which uh, you will hear about too in detail today, uh, the Share Toolkit from myself and Food Futures from Louise. Uh, one of its uh, major outputs is this, the Share City 100 database, which is a detailed database for 100 cities around the world, where you can look in your local city and see what food sharing activities are happening and zoom into um, any country and see what is shared, how it's shared and the details of how that sharing is organized. There's also been a lot of work on how food sharing differs between different cities. Again, it's all available on the website. They looked at nine cities and how the food sharing contexts differ um, in different cities. And then another key branch of the research is food sharing futures, which you'll get to hear about from Louise after myself about talking about what food sharing might look like in the future. And then what I'm going to talk about is this online sustainability impact assessment toolkit for food sharers that was developed by my predecessor, Stephen, with Anna and what the next steps are for this exciting free online toolkit and what our plans are to develop it into the future. So before um, I get into talking about shared, I thought I'd talk a little bit about food sharing and sustainable food, just to set the scene a bit. Um, I guess we could ask the question, what would a sustainable food system look like? And uh, that could be a very detailed discussion that could go on um, for a very long time. But in brief, some aspects that you could consider uh, part of a sustainable food system is it would be ecologically responsible. It would be fair and accessible to all. It would likely involve food that is locally produced and locally sourced. It would be healthy, uh, nutrient-rich food, possibly organic, and there would be very little or no waste associated with the food production and consumption system. And in an urban context, I think this quote from the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact really captures um, the useful context for what role cities can play in creating a sustainable food system. So this quote reads, current food systems are being challenged to provide permanent and reliable access to adequate, safe, local, diversified, fair, healthy and nutrient rich food for all. Cities which host over half the world population have a strategic role to play in developing sustainable food systems and promoting healthy diets. So it is very much in this context that the Share City Research Project tries to answer this challenge of a sustainable food system in an urban context. So what do we mean by urban food sharing? Well, it's been very um, clearly defined, especially for the uh, Share City 100 database. So what we mean when we say what food sharing entails, it can loosely be summarized as stuff, space and skills. Um, more specifically, it could be the sharing of plant material, the sharing of food, compost, tools, land, kitchens, community kitchens, for example, knowledge and skills, and the sharing of prepared meals. In terms of how it is shared, we look at four key categories. Bartering, where you would exchange one item for another. Gifting, which would be like similar to donations of free food to people. Selling, so we include um, food sharing that's making a profit or is selling it at, at an affordable price to its local community. And collecting, which would represent groups that are rescuing um, waste food and food that has been disposed of, but can be revalued and still used um, in the community. 
And then how are these organizations um, organized? How, how is food sharing organized? Again, several categories have been identified by the Share City research team. Um, so uh, the research considers groups that are charities and not-for-profits, social enterprises, groups that are for profit and enterprises, cooperatives, clubs, associations and networks, and also uh, small informal groups of people taking initiative in their community to share and distribute food through these means. So if we want to put all of that in brief, um, the succinct way of saying that is food sharing involves any group that grows food together, eats food together or redistributes excess food. So what role could sustainability impact assessments have for food sharers? A sustainability impact assessment is um, a set of indicator questions that capture the economic, environmental and social impacts and a group is having or a business is having or um, a university is having, for example. Um, and one of the things that Share City really wanted to look at is what role these SIAs could have for food sharers. Um, and there's lots of different benefits of sustainability impact assessments, and there's more and more uh, regulatory frameworks in place to increase sustainability accounting among different groups at present. But just some of the major um, benefits of engaging with this practice for a food sharer could be to raise awareness about the range of impacts they are having, both internally, as it could highlight positive economic, environmental or social impacts they don't they're not quite aware they're having and also externally it can really help them in communicating and articulating the positive impact their work is ha having. Um, it would also be helpful for things like funding applications, both uh, providing an evidence base to influence funding calls so that they are um, designed to help maximize these impacts and also to strengthen the applications that food sharers are making by being able to clearly articulate and provide evidence of the impact they are having. And another key benefit of sustainability impact assessments for food sharers is to equip them to plan a more resilient future, especially given the year we've just had to be able to understand where your impacts are, where they're growing, and what are the gaps in your impacts um, for how you engage in strategic planning. So that's where the Share It Toolkit came in, developed by Stephen and Anna throughout this project. It has three features and it is a completely free online toolkit. The first feature is the tool shed, which creates a sustainability impact report that illustrates the social, economic and environmental impacts of your food sharing group. It then has the talent garden where you can share stories about the the activities and impacts your work is having, and the greenhouse which aims to connect with others around the world to share experiences and learn from each other. So why use Share It? Why would Share It be um, particularly useful in this field? Well, for the tool shed, it's completely free to use. It's user friendly. It was developed in um, with getting feedback from food sharers and insights from food sharers about what is accessible to them and what are the key areas of impact they would like to be represented in the indicator questions. And it provides um, an opportunity to give both qualitative and quantitative data on the impacts you are having. The talent garden provides a space, a very important space where you can collate impacts that can't be measured in the restricted questions of the tool shed. And this could include, for example, uh, evidence of impact like photographs, videos, anecdotes, testimonials from your participants or your board members um, and other reports that you've done in the past. You can collate and share them in this talent garden to complement the impact assessment you've done in the tool shed. And finally, the greenhouse aims to achieve translocal empowerment by connecting local groups around the world facing similar challenges so that they can share knowledge and skills and learning with each other. So the impact areas that the tool shed will ask questions about, there's four key areas of questions and it totals 34 questions that collect quantitative or qualitative answers. And these four areas are environment, social, economic and governance. In the environment section of the tool shed, you would be asked about your practices around the food sharing initiative and what emissions are involved and what waste is either saved or generated by the practices of the food sharing. In the social questions, there's questions around the accessibility, around health and well-being, and around the community that's being built by sharing food together. Uh, economically, there's questions around any jobs being generated, the affordability of food and the production. 
And then there's also questions about governance, such as risk control, strategic planning and civic responsibility. So this entire suite of indicator questions is what would comprise um, the tool shed sustainability impact assessment and it would ultimately produce a detailed graphic uh, illustrated report which looks so here are just some excerpts of the report and there is a full example report available on the website if you'd like to see more and um, but i just pulled a few sections of the report to give you an idea of what it looks like so it would clearly summarize the goals and activities of the food sharing initiative as you can see in the top left here it would have a space for quantitative impacts like here in green on the top right where it has the number of participants and the number of portions of food so very quantitative um, it creates this sort of pie chart that demonstrates the key areas of significant impact which is complemented by qualitative commentary on what these key areas are as verbalized or articulated by the food sharing group themselves and you can see in this chart it shows you how much of an impact you are having in the sections of governance social environmental and economic there's another section of the report that also highlights and gives a score to how many direct and indirect impacts you are having in these areas and finally then it will also connect your work to the sustainable development goals and show how your food sharing is directly um, helping achieve these sustainable development goals at your local level so what are our strategic goals now um, as we've gotten to this stage with the Share It Online Toolkit? Um, well, our goal is for sustainability impact assessments to be accessible for all food sharers so that sustainability reporting can become a normalised practice among this emerging sector. And it is hoped that by food sharers being able to um, provide this sustainability reporting, it can influence policies and funding to maximize the impacts of food sharing, which would, in theory, hopefully help them have more capacity to engage with more sustainability reporting. And we can generally elevate the visibility of these impacts and provide a favorable regulatory environment for these initiatives. So our interim goals to that end then are, well, firstly, um, I'm hoping to connect with as many food sharers as possible and show them the uh, Share It Toolkit and help them in producing a sustainability report while gathering feedback on their user experience while producing that report. I then want to bring those reports to funding groups and policymakers and get any feedback or information I can from those type of groups about how relevant and useful and accessible this report is, how it can be improved, what they would like to see in sustainability reporting. I then would bring all of this feedback back to the Share It tool um, and hopefully to upgrade it based on all of this feedback and modify it and then bring it back in its new iteration to the food sharers, hopefully now at an even more maximized impact level of the product it produces. So some of the user experience upgrades that um, I want or that we're hoping to do over the next few months um, pending funding is to develop firstly bespoke pathways. So what I mean by that is currently um, the Share It Toolkit provides an entire suite of indicator questions for all different types of food sharing initiatives. So that can include eating together, growing together and redistributing excess food. While you do not have to answer all of the questions on the tool shed, it can create an impression that there is a a bigger workload than um, you're able to do for completing the sustainability impact assessment. Uh, food sharers only have to answer the questions relevant to them and they can leave other questions blank. But it has, based on the feedback that Stephen has collected, it will definitely be helpful to food sharers if they only see questions that are most relevant to their practices and aren't distracted by irrelevant questions. So from that, it'd be interesting to explore developing bespoke pathways so you can say what type of food sharing you you do and only see the questions relevant to yours and you don't have to um, filter through the entire indicator suite. Another user experience upgrade is to look at um, how to provide capacity support. So again, a lot of the feedback did show that food sharers um, obviously uh, don't have huge capacity for paperwork and extra reporting loads and engaging in more reporting. So while there was an interest and a want to capture their sustainability and impact um, account accounting, um, they would need additional support, especially the smaller groups, in order to be able to complete this entire process of using the tool shed to create 
create the output report. So we want to look at different user models and how much one to one support we can provide. Um, and then uh, finally, we'd like to translate the toolkit into different languages um, so that it can be used by a more international uh, group of food sharers. So those are the overall goals of user experience upgrades. We also have some technical upgrades we'd like to make. We'd like to introduce some more editing flexibility. The current uh, share it toolkit, um, when you produce your final report, you can't go back and tweak and edit it. If you want to, produce, to change it in any way, you would have to go through the whole process again to produce your report. Report. So we'd like to change that so that you can go back and edit the reports uh, piece by piece and not have to answer all of the questions again if you want to update and change some of your data in the uh, report. Uh, we'd like to look at the design and see if we can improve it, especially if it could generate social media graphics, for example, for food sharers um, and make it more instantly understandable to people who maybe aren't from an academic or scientific background, that they can instantly visually see what impact this food sharing group is having. So we'd like to review the report design. And we'd like to launch the greenhouse. So when we have enough active participants um, in the shared community using the toolkit, we'd like to activate the greenhouse and start connecting them together so that they can equip and empower each other remotely uh, from different um, contexts facing similar challenges. So in the interim, the, this is all pending more funding to do these more detailed upgrades, but in the interim to continue um, gathering feedback um, and to gather evidence for these funding applications. Um, we are offering one to one virtual support to any food sharers, so I myself can video call any food sharer and talk them through the tool shed and help them with that capacity barrier um, to engage in sustainability reporting. Uh, we're developing new video tutorials um, on how to complete the um, tool shed questions and how and we're also updating the reader materials and the user guide to make it as accessible as possible um, to the audience. So the next steps then is um, I'm currently working to create a contact database of as many uh, food sharers, funders, policymakers as possible. And if any of you um, know people in your network, please do drop me an email um, and let me know anyone you think who might be interested in this. I'm trying to get as many contacts as possible. Um, and then I'm inviting these food sharers to try out the Share It Toolkit and I'm offering them my support in um, completing the tool shed um, and gathering any feedback they have on their user experience of the Share It Toolkit, and then consolidating all of this feedback together and planning the future of Share It and what it might look like if it does extend beyond the uh, end of the Share City research project. So um, the output of this piece of work, of this work plan, is to do a full review of the overall functionality of the Share It Toolkit. Um, look at costs of different user support and how much it would cost to provide one-to-one -one support to food sharers wanting to engage in sustainability reporting. Um, review the usability of the tool, which I hope to get input from as many food sharers as possible who will use the tool and let me know what barriers they face in trying to complete their uh, impact assessment. The usability of the output reports for which I'll seek feedback from um, policymakers and funding groups um, to really see um, how to maximize what, how these reports can be useful and practical to different funding calls, different funding reporting, um, and how it can be integrated into um, policymaking. So with this evidence base that I'm currently gathering, we hope to write a proof of concept grant application for the Share It Toolkit. And as part of this, we'll develop a detailed business plan for what Share It might look like as a social enterprise. And we'd look at a timeline to market, sorry, um, and an engagement strategy on how to promote and disseminate Share It as widely as possible to as many food sharing groups as possible. Um, and then the overall goal of all of this uh, work is to up, get funding to upgrade Share It and to look at a way to sustain Share It into the future in a self-sustaining model, perhaps as a social enterprise. So thank you for um, your time and um, I look forward to seeing any questions you have um, about the share tool and again just to emphasize I'm um, looking for any contact details on food sharing groups community groups that might be interested in trying this out um, and any policymakers or funding groups that you think might be curious about uh, these output reports that the share a toolkit can produce um, so thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Alwyn. Um, lots of interesting things there, and I'm sure there'll be some great questions to follow. So perhaps we go straight into Louise's presentation when you're ready, and then we can come to questions at the end. Yeah, sure thing. I'll just share screen. 
here we go. Can you all see that okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. So yeah, thank you so much. I'm really happy uh, to be taking part in the seminar and to get to meet some of you and put um, faces to names. So um, yeah, I'll be talking about food sharing future scenarios, um, which is, is my um, work um, at Share City since I joined in June. Um, so yeah, like was said, thank you for the introduction. Um, my background is, is political science, but I've also been involved in environmental justice movements. So um, I'm, I'm coming from you know, policy analysis, but more critical approaches such as um, political economy and political ecology uh, in particular approaches were what I used in my um, PhD. So this work is really also informed by that. Um, so just to give an overview of what I'm going to talk about, um, firstly, I'm going to give uh, an introduction to futuring around food sharing, then uh, place this in context by building on what Alwyn says and just placing it in the, the context of share city research to date. And um, then I'll talk about uh, the approach that we're using to futuring and um, then three future scenarios for, for food sharing and um, elements of futuring that we should, should keep in mind and that I think are important that are um, brought out by the approach that we're hoping to use. And then finally, just some um, reflections and next steps for our futuring work in the next few months. Um, so just to give an introduction, so um, there's very much increased attention uh, um, for the idea of, of futuring and looking to the future when we think about the different climate targets and sustainability targets, which bring us to 2030 or 2050. Um, and there's also increasing need for futuring. So when we look at how um, complex and dynamic the world is and um, really fast paced trends such as urbanization and climate change, it really brings up some fundamental questions about the future, such as what do we want our cities to be? And um, of particular interest to share city, what is the, the role of, of food sharing in, in bringing into um, being these more sustainable and just futures as Alwyn um, really well outlined in her talk, talking also about the Milano, uh, Milan Food Pact. Um, also looking at trends like technological innovation and um, really critical questions about what does this moon mean for the role of urban food sharing in the future? And um, what are the, the broader challenges and opportunities that come with um, technological innovation and technological imaginaries increasingly intersecting with how food is produced and consumed within cities? And really futuring uh, broadly is about exploring these trends and, and seeking to make sense of them and seeking to make sense um, of what it will mean for our particular issue of interest, which is um, food sharing. So to place this in, in the context of share city research, um, Owen already talked about it and, and gave a really good overview. Um, and share city in its, in its uh, last four years has identified how in different urban contexts, food sharing practices, um, as were defined by Owen, have um, really significant social and environmental benefits in, um, in urban contexts. Um, also, the work of Share City has um, identified challenges uh, that food sharing practices face, um, including governance or, or rule based challenges, um, which really are arising from a, a regulatory environment that's mismatched with its activities, um, which then places burdens on them or leaves them uh, lacking support that really curtails its activities, their activities, and um, then realizing these really important social and environmental benefits that they're able to contribute to. Um, but it's very difficult to address these regulatory uh, barriers and these rule-based challenges um, due to a lack of an engagement from policymakers. So food sharers often find that um, they've no go-to person um, in relation to policymakers. Um, they, they're not really, uh, food sharing isn't really seen um, by policymakers or isn't really seen as their area of responsibility and is really just uh, essentially kind of left out in, in the dark. and. Um, Share City as, as a project also experienced uh, challenges around engagement from policymakers. So really kind of out of this experience and out of what the Share City project has found so far, um, the inquiry here is could uh, futuring and in particular visualizations of future scenarios around food sharing perhaps help as a tool of engagement um, for, for policymakers and, and other actors. Um, so 
the, the tool that we're using as, as a kind of initial framing device for the futuring work we want to do is something called the Three Horizons framework. So Three Horizons is a simple intuitive tool for thinking about the future. And what it does is it draws attention to different futures as already existing in the present. So if we look around us, we can see different versions of the future um, already being enacted in, in different practices by different people. And Three Horizons really draws our attention to what we can already see in the present as kind of signs of what could happen in the future going forward. Um, these are represented by different horizons um, and contained within all patterns we see all around us and the horizons I'll, I'll talk through in, in the next slide. So the framework was um, developed by someone called Bill Sharp and others, and it's all accessible online. And um, a lot of it is used, uh, it's used a lot of the time in, in group, transformative group processes where you bring all different actors around the table. So they've put everything available online because they wanted to make it as open access. And um, so it's called the International Futures Forum, or if you just Google that, if you want to look into, into it in more detail. And what we're going to do is using share city research to date and um, develop these scenarios using this as an initial framing device. And as well as allowing us to explore the kind of broader trends which will shape um, food sharing futures going forward. So like I talked about these broader trends of um, technological change and um, trends like this. So the Three Horizons framework is um, represented visually um, as we see here. And I'll talk us through um, the various elements so the, the first horizon, which is represented here in red, is horizon one. And this is the, the managerial view. So this is um, very much dominant actors and familiar ways of doing things, familiar practices um, that we see around us all, all the time, really business as usual. Um, horizon three, which is represented in green down below, this is known as the, the visionary horizon or the visionary view. And this is essentially pockets of the future we can already see in the present. So um, different groups, different ideas that are articulating um, very different assumptions about how we relate um, to, to one another, how we relate to nature. And um, something that came up a lot in, in Share City work to date in workshops was um, ideas such as food as common. So these very visionary um, alternatives. Um, and then horizon two, which is represented here in blue is the entrepreneurial view. So this is a, a zone of innovation and um, it's highly turbulent as um, actors try uh, different things out and try and, um, and change the business as usual system. Um, importantly in this, in this zone of innovations and, and what we already know is that some, some innovations are more likely than others to contribute to, to really shifting um, business as usual. So some will get eaten up by horizon one by business as usual and these are known as horizon two minus innovations, but importantly, some innovations will contribute to those transformative shifts um, that we would like to see. And these are known as horizon two plus innovations. And the X axis here is time. So that's how these patterns are changing over time. And the Y axis is, is pattern or, or strategic fit. So if we look at it, we can see that horizon one business as usual is losing its strategic fit over time, which we know um, is the case in a, in a lot of issues that we're, that we're engaging with and is certainly the case with regards to the, the food system, that there's a lot of issues with regards to justice and sustainability and it's losing that strategic fit. So Three Horizons, um, like I said, is going to be used as an initial sort of framing device for the futuring work we want to do. Um, so using the in-depth data that Share City has already gathered over the last four years, um, we'll use this to identify the different um, actors and assumptions and practices as they sit on the different horizons. Um, within three horizons, what's also possible is to um, do scenario planning, um, which is used to look at, okay, how do we deal with different scenarios as they come up? And what this offers us and what I'm going to bring us through is um, archetypes of transition processes. So the people who develop three, three horizons have, have spent a lot of time looking at how transitions happen and have basically articulated a number of, of archetypes or variants for how transition processes can go. And um, the important thing to note in Three Horizons is that um, it's, it's called, uh, the scenarios that we develop in Three Horizons are called transformative or, or normative scenarios. So it's not like, um, oftentimes with kind of mainstream scenario planning, uh, it's looking at scenarios of what could happen due to external factors. And um, so it's sort of like things that could happen to us 
that we then have to plan for. Um, rather, um, in Three Horizons, it's, it's transformative or normative in the sense that we set a vision that we want for the future and that we have a stake in and that we want to do something actively to, to bring that into being. So um, in this case, the kind of transformative or normative scenario we have, like Owen already outlined, is really around a more just and diverse and sustainable uh, urban food system. So um, based on this, like I said, we can articulate different um, scenarios of the future. And I'll just talk us through each of them. So there's going to be three scenarios um, that I'll talk about. Um, scenario one um, is the variant known as challenge and, and, and transformation. And this is the, the um, similar to the diagram we already just saw when I introduced the tool. Um, so really in this, what we have as we look across time is that business as usual, um, that there's, there's really a shift um, towards this emergence of a more, a more viable future, a more just and sustainable future. Um, so in this scenario, what we might see from policymakers, from those business as usual actors, for example, is bringing in um, policies to support uh, food sharing, to support these, these, um, these niche innovators that are helping to bring in to being these more just and sustainable alternatives. Um, a kind of textbook example there um, of policy actors helping to make this food transition um, is often talked about the, the feed and tariff policies that were introduced in places like Germany which um, helped shift resources from the kind of dominant energy system to um, those who were innovating in, in renewable energies um, and really helped facilitate those shifts in, in um, resources. So really what we would see here is, is the support and the emergence of a more, more diverse um, food system, um, a more diverse resilient food system. And technology, for example, could play a part in this um, in helping to build trust. It could be an enabler. So um, actors such as food sharing, like we've already seen using technology and using this, these disruptions to help them um, shift patterns away from, from business as usual problematic uh, practices. So um, the second uh, scenario we can think about is um, something called collapse and slow recovery. So within this scenario, what we would see is innovation essentially being curtailed. Um, maybe due to a lack of supportive policy, a lack of policy by H1 actors to, um, to help um, that smooth transition that we saw in the first um, scenario to help that ha happen. Um, and really what this leads to is a failure to shift to a more uh, resilient system. And, and um, because we know that business as usual, uh, in particular in regards to food, it isn't um, sustainable. We know it's very open to shocks and we've seen that um, in recent months, of course. Um, really what happens here is that um, there's a failure to transition to a more viable system and the because business as usual is no longer having a strategic fit, it leads to some sort of collapse in the system, an abrupt collapse as a result of external pressures and, and disruptions, for example. Um, and this would lead to, to very chaotic outcomes because you would have a, um, a collapse in the system um, with associated social and environmental impacts. So it would be a very chaotic um, transition with all the kind of associated, associated harms. Um, and then the um, final uh, scenario we can talk about is something called capture and extension. And in this version, um, basically there will be some innovations, but they're largely um, based on business as usual assumptions. So um, they might be, for example, very uh, commercial facing innovations that are um, you know, driven by profit rather than trying in some way to, to really disrupt the system of relations that we have right now. Um, and because they're having business as usual assumptions, um, they're very easily captured by business as usual. So these are the horizon two minus um, innovations that I talked about when I introduced the tool. And essentially what that means is they're continuously captured by business as usual to sustain itself um, rather than allow for this more transformative um, alternative, which is represented by um, horizon three, the green line to, to emerge. So it basically delays the emergence of this, um, this more viable alternative future. And of course, that's also associated um, with problematic outcomes um, in the transition taking longer than it, than it should. Um, so kind of three elements that I think are, are important in futuring and that are, that are enabled by the Three Horizons tool is um, firstly, uh, making power and agency explicit. So 
Um, H1 actors as incumbent players and policymakers have the power to inhibit or support transformations to more just and sustainable food systems. Um, and, and that's really made quite clear by, by Horizon One, and it's something we, we all know, but it's important, of course, to state it. Um, within Horizon, within Three Horizons as well, um, importantly, everyone can be agents of change. So it really elevates um, food sharers as being those, those kind of innovators that we see, those, those social um, innovators in trying new things out and trying to, to shift the system um, within that zone of, of innovation. Um, it also enables us to evaluate uh, disruptive innovation. So in that discerning between um, Horizon 2 minus, which are going to contribute to perpetuating the, the problematic system, um, and Horizon 2 plus innovations, which are going to help us with those transformative shifts we want to see, um, that really helps us to be a bit more discerning about where we place our, our energy and resources. So what innovations we, we, we need to support and should be just supported in order to disrupt um, Horizon 1 and help us make that uh, smooth transition. And then finally, um, it allows us to include um, marginalized voices. So this is getting to the, the kind of political ecology or political economy understandings of uh, sustainable transitions, which would say that they're, they're highly contested. There's no, no one pathway, but there's many different approaches. Um, but oftentimes it's, it's the kind of elite perspectives that get um, that, that pathway, policy pathway is closed down around. Um, and there's a need to, to kind of open up and include more plural voices. And Three Horizons does this by, by, plotting, um, by plotting all of the, the different actors together and really, like I said, giving attention to those, those innovators as important ag agents of change. And um, of course, for, for our purposes, um, including these plural perspectives helps to highlight these social and environmental benefits that are, that are already being, um, that are already existing within food sharing uh, practices. So just um, some reflections and next steps. Um, so Three Horizons, it, it's a useful framework for, for plotting different futures based on practices we can see now. Um, within the context of you know, um, doing research in these times, it, it can help us understand what could happen. So it, it has some benefits um, within the limitations that we face. Um, our next step is to develop visualizations of um, business as usual, as well as the, these um, scenarios that I've outlined to you with an artistic illustrator in order to make um, these futures more accessible and hopefully resonate with people through having that, that kind of visual, visualization. And um, um, time and other uh, limits um, depending, um, we hope to show these to um, some policymakers and seek feedback on these visualizations just to get essentially a litmus test of how helpful this is in order to engage um, them on these issues. Um, and this will be along with developing a manifesto for food sharing about how we can bring into being this more just and sustainable food system, as well as the share a tool like um, and work that Alwyn um, really well outlined previously. Um, so just in conclusion, uh, thinking about the future is important for food sharing going forward. It allows us to um, identify the challenges and how these will continue into the future if not addressed by, um, for example, policymakers. Um, some versions of the future are more desirable than others, as outlined, and um, some versions of the transition. So, you know, the outcome, the transition is just as important um, as the outcome. So how we get there, the process is, is really important. Um, and some versions of that are, as in the first version, is, is much smoother. And that's more what we would like to see than the other versions which are involved in um, more kind of chaotic and problematic outcomes. And which of these becomes the future depends on what action we take now. And in recognizing um, that the variants of the future exists now in the present, um, everyone can play a part in realizing these more positive futures and these more desirable futures that we hope to see. So uh, thank you so much for listening. And yeah, please do feel free to get in touch. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Louise. Um, and Alwyn, again, I, I can see there's already a couple of questions. And I'm sure there'll be great opportunities for some discussion here. So if anyone wants to write down their questions, please take a moment, feel free. Uh, Steph, shall I start reading or do you wanna take the first batch to, to read out? Uh, very happy for you to go first. Okay, um, well, I will use the chair's prerogative then since the first question is actually my own. Um, so the first question would just be more directed towards uh, the toolkit. However, it probably fits to with the, I think, quite praxis-driven approach to this project more generally. But 
I was wondering if you thought the toolkit could be incorporated into higher education learning and assessment activities, perhaps as a way of helping students to develop evaluation skills, while also providing additional research capacity for food sharers. And the second question that we have uh, thus far is from Maeve, and it's to both speakers, and she is asking, in terms of assessing impact and futuring scenarios, how much scope do you think can be offered to include or capture the axes of difference within food sharing initiatives, e.g. based on gender, class, race, paid or voluntary, I'm gonna presume she means labor there. Um, and are these types of toolkit and futuring tools useful for pushing policy to attend to these differences? Super, thanks for that. Um, I'll, I'll jump in on your on your first question there. Um, yeah, I like I like that idea of resourcing the support for food sharers through, for example, a student assignment in um, like a higher education uh, context. Um, I have a little bit of experience with uh, integrating students into like local community initiatives. So I'll just like speak to that and some of the the challenges and opportunities that offers. Um, I think students are an amazing resource to their local community, um, but you have this challenge of the individuals are transient, but the presence of students is continuous. So how do you manage that resource in a way that we would provide um, like consistent quality in the service provision we would offer food sharers um, and also the organizational memory of that of a food sharer wants to come back and they worked with a specific student um, and then also the other uh, key resource we'd have to develop is how to um, meaningfully equip those students uh, to have enough competency in sustainability impact assessments to be able to um, answer all of the food sharers questions and provide them with uh, meaningful support and to make sure that it is beneficial to both the student and the community community group. Um, so I know like from working in a community group myself, um, one of the problems is uh, we are managing put the opportunities that come with public willpower, which is quite transient. So you would very often pause a project to jump on something. For, for example, I came from a women's rights sector. When Me Too happened, every project was paused. And that would be very unfair for a student if in this context, we have to be very flexible and very reactive to get the most out of uh, policy lobbying and funding opportunities as a charity group. Um, you do have to be very reactive, which might not fit into the uh, very restricted timelines of a curriculum. But I already can think of opportunities around that like maybe the assignment isn't in producing the output report maybe it's in reviewing the challenges to producing an output report so a student who had a food sharer that didn't have capacity to complete to the completion of the output report within the timeline of the student's assignment would still have every opportunity to do well in that assignment to be fair to that student so it's a mutually beneficial experience so I think yeah capturing the, the sort of uh, resources of as, as long as it's done ethically as we say with student labor there's a lot of ethical considerations around that um, um, and then also done in a way that you know protects the quality control of the share it brand and is fair to the food sharers as well those would be the initial challenges i'd love to tease out for that opportunity but i think given that the share it toolkit is completely free and students in the past have actually made kind of um, made up um, accounts just to test it out and just to look at it that could even be um, an independent uh, assignment a student could do if they wanted to create a fictional food sharing group and learn about sustainability impact assessments it's already functional for that purpose um, and then to be able to I would love to see a situation where students and uh, community groups could interact and support each other um, and further integrate student communities into their local communities I think that would be really interesting to explore so I really really like that question and it brings up more questions for me um, so I don't I'm not sure if I answered or just presented more questions but uh, that's my initial thoughts on it and for the second question um, I don't know if Alwyn or Louise either one of you maybe wants to take that uh, is this Maeve's question yes okay I think it was for us both I don't do you want to keep going or will I jump in you jump in Louise there okay um yeah so about uh, capturing uh, differences within food sharing activities um, so in terms of uh, futuring tools, um, yeah, Three Horizons, like I said, it's it's really uh, explicitly about opening to those plural perspectives. Um, and like, a, you know, usually um, these sort of futuring processes or policymaking in general is really dominated by elite actors. I mean, I guess we already know that in elite perspectives. Um, and, and, and really, yeah, it's about bringing in those marginalized perspectives held by food sharers also, um, which would enable us to identify uh, solutions that are actually far more just and sustainable than the current pathway that we're on and the current policy that are being um, implemented. And 
um, you know, part of that is um, trying to elevate the supports that food chairs are asking for. And within um, Share City and um, the workshop like Sharing Futures, which there's information about online, um, a lot of what food chairs were asking for were actually um, resources to be able to make their work more intersectional. So them themselves trying to reach out to um, groups that would be you know, usually marginalized within the within the food system, <clears throat> which I think are also including the groups that you've mentioned. Um, so the, the purpose is to kind of try and bring in and elevate those food sharing perspectives and what they're asking for from, from um, policymakers. And within that, um, yeah, this would, would definitely be elevated and hopefully if they got supports then food sharing more broadly would be able to resource itself to become more intersectional. Um, yeah, I don't know if you wanna go on Alwyn because it's also, I think for you. Yes, thanks Louise. Yeah, so just to add on to what Louise was saying there, uh, specifically with the Share It toolkit and in terms of, as you mentioned, impact, um, the areas that would capture that kind of data would be the, the social questions and um, the economic questions with regards to voluntary or paid labour. Um, so in that sense, the Share It toolkit would capture, for example, like a score a, a, of indirect and direct impacts in those areas. Now, I would say it definitely wouldn't be the ethos of Share It to, for, um, to be in any way divisive or have Share food sharers comparing and competing on those metrics. I don't think that's necessarily super, super helpful. Um, and it would be more about equipping them internally to identify where they could improve their impact in those areas if they did have maybe a slightly lower score in, in one area or another. Um, but I do think the share toolkit does capture some of that data, not necessarily to make comparisons between food sharing, but again, more to really emphasize the positive impacts they are having. As Louise touched on, a lot of them would already have like quite an inclusive ethos um, in their mission statement um, and in their goals. So hopefully the Share It toolkit would highlight and emphasize these and also highlight areas of, that could be um, improved and strengthened um, in the future. So, and then, and then on that, um, similar to Louise, we're, we are considering commissioning an illustrator to design some um, different characters and contexts of food sharers to help with our um, visualization of um, the Share It brand. And that's um, really brought up some really interesting questions about the ethics around inclusive design and um, what should these character personas look like what should they represent and how can we um, demonstrate this ethos of like inclusivity in the food sharing community in the food sharing sector um, and at this point we are actually like emailing different stakeholders and different food sharers asking them what do you think what do you think about like gender class race representation in these uh, illustrate of complete like freedom we have an illustrator to draw whatever um, kind of different types of characters we would like and we're getting some very interesting feedback and response responses about um, some of the challenges of inclusive design and me practicing meaningful inclusivity as share it ourselves because um, we can't ask questions if we're not authentically reviewing it ourselves and how we um, address some of those challenges. So um, yeah, so I think if you have any further thoughts on that, I'd love to hear from you, Maeve. Fantastic. We have a further three questions and I think given time, I'm gonna cut off with those if that's all right. So I'll just run through them quickly and then maybe you can each take a turn to kind of answer the ones that are relevant to you. Uh, fantastic. So the, the next one is from Iris, who says, uh, thanks for a couple of great talks. Uh, she wondered whether you could say a little bit more about what and how important the role of the private sector is relative to charitable NGO government in food sharing overall and the various futures that we might see. The next question then is from Kian and asks, from the Share City research and the work on future scenarios, what kinds of transformative actions do you think are necessary in terms of sharing in brackets, urban land specifically. And the final question we have is from Rory, and he says as well, a great thanks to both of you, mentioning he hadn't heard of the Three Horizons framework before and found it very interesting, and wondered if you could say a little bit more about where state institutions lie within these three different horizons. He notes that, is the state counted as a H1 actor as opposed to an entrepreneurial, bracket H2, or more marginal civil society actor, and therefore identified as business as usual features, or are state institutions understood to cut across different categories? So a fair bit on futures, but if you both want to take a turn for um, any responses to those questions yeah. or final remarks. Maybe I'll jump in on the first one, Louise, and think the second two are, are a little bit more future emphasized. Um, in terms of the sure. role of private sector. Um, uh, so in, um, in Iris's question, and it's relative to charitable NGO government food sharing overall, and the various features we might see, um, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. Like we do, of course, uh, include the private sector in the share in what we define as sharing, we include for 
profit as a type of sharing. Um, another factor we are considering is what role, so obviously we're looking at different user models for the share at toolkit, we're looking at what it would look like if, for example, a staff member like myself did video calling um, with these food sharers to complete their impact assessment. Um, we're looking at how to fund that because it certainly wouldn't be these small uh, grassroots community groups that would have the resources to um, access that kind of support and to sustainably fund that. So I really think the private sector might be worth considering as a, as a financing source in terms of corporate social responsibility um, and their different portfolios in that regard. Um, and possibly if they were to, um, as a private for profit sector, pay a consultancy fee for us to help them with their sustainability impact reporting and then the excess of that fee could help support um, a group that, that doesn't necessarily have the funding to access the one-to-one -one support and um, so that's my initial thoughts on the role the private sector could pay play we do see even in the present day we see great collaborations between private sectors especially with the waste redistribution of food sharing and supermarkets uh, facilitating that with community groups and not-for-profit groups as part of their corporate social responsibility and again it'd be great to point out like if shared could be a way for them to see the impact of that and if their community groups are using the share tool it would help them in um showing the impact of their corporate social responsibility as a private um uh, industry so so those are my initial thoughts on that and i'll hand over to you louise for those future questions um yeah okay great uh thanks yeah on iris's question as well um in the various futures in the positive more desirable future where you have this transformation um the the there would be the diverse just food system we want to see and the private sector that would provide the context for the private sector to sit in so rather than now where we have the private sector kind of being the dominant actor it would um it would shift that in, in relation to the more desirable future that's just to briefly touch upon that um that and what alwyn said um on rory's question um yeah the state so it, it basically depends what they're doing um but in this case and in the case of what we've seen in the um, urban food systems and the current kind of regulatory environment um, really the state and, and in most other instances the state would be predominantly a horizon one actor and that's because the horizon one actors are those having the managerial view so all their mindset is really about is like managing the system keeping things going um, and um, which which unfortunately inhibits change if unless they take an active role in in those kind of supporting niches like what we talked about um so they can move into being supportive of h2 but but broadly their their focus is on managing the system and it should be said you know there's value in that as well like in having this transition we want it to be as smooth as possible so there's actually a lot of things that go on in our day-to-day -day that have have to stay the same um, and the kind of analogy that they use in three horizons is you know how can we keep keep redesign the plane while keeping it in the air so it's kind of really about that it's about this smoother transition that we want to see which horizon one actors as managers can also have a, an important um role in helping it to be smooth so they, they there's a benefit to them as well and there's also some elements of horizon one that we'd want to keep such as like food safety and things like that you know so we want to preserve them as well so it's not like throwing the baby out with the bat water um and then i think anna already answered kian's question um, was there anything else? Uh... I'm not sure if if uh, we received. Uh, uh, maybe you could just say a couple more words on Kian's question, if you don't. Oh right, it. okay, sorry, yeah, that came to me. Um, sorry. So Kian, um, uh, a transformative urban lab. Yeah, okay. So um, just to share what food. So a lot of this is really, like I said, is like elevating what food sharers are already saying. So we're not inventing anything new. It's really just trying to put their perspectives to the fore and really um there's clear issues around um land and access to land and there's a need for um there's a need for longer term leases so if we think about um urban gardening for example um you know often it's very precarious and then it's taken back by the council and you know that means that gardens have they're often given very short um short time frames to move everything which is obviously really upsetting if you've invested a lot of time in a garden and prevents people from um from gardening and in, in, in not being able to access um access land so there's there's clear uh, need to to address that and and really that's around values as well so like um, urban gardening, uh, urban garden and food sharing activities being being really valued as important parts of the fabric of of urban 
um, of the urban environment for all the social and environmental benefits that we've spoken about. And um, so again, that gets back to kind of them being food sharing, even just being seen, you know, first being seen and then being valued. And of course, that's where also um, Alwyn's, you know, great work with, with Sherrod is coming in to really try and communicate those diverse um, values that food sharing um, brings into being that's oftentimes just, just not really seen or not really appreciated. And hopefully then that will mean that um, land access issues and, and getting longer term leases are are addressed.